that leads me really to um, talk about two concepts that are at the heart of this project and ultimately need to be at the heart of everything we do in terms of facing the ecological and climate crises of our time. If we could have this slide, please. So yeah, the two concepts are restoration and collaboration. Obviously, the Suffolk Scout Restoration Project is why we're here today. And um, this is an ambitious and pioneering um, nature-based solution to restore our coastal ecosystems to biodiversity, food security, and climate. And so when we talk about nature-based solutions, um, what is that exactly? And really it's actions that are taken to protect, sustainably manage, and restore modified ecosystems. So here in Sussex, as we've seen, the seabed is modified and, um, and degraded. And so we need to restore that. And at the heart of that needs to be human well-being and biodiversity. So we talk about restoration sort of specifically in terms of the wider biodiversity benefits and, and as we've heard, how kelp supports that. But I wanted to sort of take a step back for a minute and, and this links in very much with Sarah's film and, and Eric, for example, is that we all deeply care. We care about our environment and we care about our oceans. And particularly here in Sussex, on the coast, we care deeply about this project and about these actions. So we have to, there's a level of responsibility and moral obligation that goes with that. So I sort of decided to look up the term restore and what that means. And obviously, in terms of the kelp, we've lost 96%. You know, obviously there's anecdotal evidence that you'll hear today and hopeful signs, but ultimately we have lost 96% and there is still only 4% of it remaining. So we need to return that kelp, to restore that kelp, and that is ultimately one of our chief goals. Um, but also the second definition, so returning the kelp to the earlier good condition, but also the second point, I think really pertinent given the climate crisis and the ecological crisis, is that we need to return something that has been lost or stolen back to the people or person that it belongs to. And so really, um, if you look at this, I think we're all painfully aware of how much has been lost and stolen, not only from communities and even nations in the past, but also communities in terms of their future. So our children's future and our community's future, and those communities facing the worst impacts of climate change globally. So I think it's our moral duty to ensure that we do everything we can to restore nature for future generations. And that means we must work collaboratively and for everyone to ensure our efforts are just and equitable. And one of the key elements of that is that we need to have really strong principles that underpin the ecosystem restoration. Because ecosystem restoration, as you've heard, not only kelp restoration, but ecosystem restoration is a relatively new science. And it's hugely complex. Um, you're not just studying, say, one species or one area. It's the entire ecosystem. And so then in the marine environment, that's even more complex and more dynamic. So in order to ensure that we have best practice and we take our morals and, and, and responsibilities seriously, we have to ensure that we follow specific guidelines and standards that exist. And with the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, there's really strong principles that underpin ecological restoration that have been developed. But just to say that collaborative restoration needs to have those strong principles, sound science, and engaged communities. And so in terms of underpinning this ecosystem restoration project, the, the 10 principles developed with, by the United Nations Ecosystem of Restoration, we will follow those 10 principles. And one area I want to particularly highlight in this, in this project is knowledge integration. So obviously we've heard from these incredible scientists doing all this work over numbers of years, 
and there are still lots of questions that are unanswered. And I think that's another key sense that we need to proceed with perseverance but humility and accept that there are things we just don't know and that the science needs to be done in order to answer those questions. And that forms the, the basis of the ecological restoration, is knowing what questions we need to answer. So as you've heard, people talking about the hope and how the seabed is showing signs of recovery. But ultimately, like I say, we have lost 96%. So this bit of data here is just like a snapshot of the summer. And this is not only data that's been contributed by scientific studies and research, but also by citizen science. And you'll be hearing a lot more from the communities that have been contributing to that citizen science through the Sea Search and the Kelp Recording Scheme. But this just gives you a snapshot. So we know where there are there is kelp, but there's also bound to be more kelp that we're just not aware of yet. So there's a huge amount of monitoring and research that needs to be done to establish our baselines and work from that. And like I say, the idea about collaboration is about how we work together. So it's not just scientists working in isolation, and it's not just communities trying to do everything they can to protect that that they love. It's that we come together. And so this is just a, a, a selection, and, and not actually everyone, of the key stakeholders that we're working with. And, um, and I'd just like to say that, um, you know, as much as we, uh, there's a lot of work that we've done and we're at the beginning of an incredible journey, there's a lot of answers, questions that still need answering. And what we need to do is do it together. And so I'll just finish on Ryuno Fukutoro's quote, individually we are one drop, together we are an ocean. Thank you. Thanks to Sarah Cunliffe from Big Wave Productions. We're going to have our kelp science film, which will give you an idea of the amazing work that's been done just this summer from our ecological science team. Off the Sussex coast, there were once vast underwater forests. Known as kelp, it was home to a wealth of creatures. Now, only pockets of these life-generating forests remain. Casualties of changing fishing practices, which damaged the seabed, and other possible factors like climate change and increased sediment in the water, which blocks the kelp's light. In March 2021, the Sussex Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority secured a landmark ban on inshore trawling to let the seabed recover. This will be regeneration of a wildlife habitat on a, on a huge scale. The area we're protecting is 270 kilometres squared of seabed. So since the bylaw was passed in March, um, we've been super busy, you know, it's been a, an intense six months rising to the challenge of studying the marine ecosystem and getting that baseline data that's really crucial for us to understand how the seabed is changing and recovering. Here's a look at the environmental research being done by the partners in the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project this summer. Sussex IFCA have been doing some video surveys to monitor any changes in habitat following the introduction of our bylaw. We've been using the ROV deploying off our ship Watchful, where there used to be some historic kelp beds. Uh, so we're, we're going along a transect at the moment. 
We're trying to get some baseline data that we will be able to compare in future years to see the changes in habitat. So right now, where there used to be quite healthy kelp growing, is actually quite depleted. We're seeing quite a lot of bare pebbly ground. Uh, we're looking for species of kelp um, and what other algal species there are. Just going past some right now, I think that's some saccharina. So kelp beds are really vital nursery grounds and that's why we really want to see them come back so that we can ensure a long-term sustainable inshore fishery. And I think the really interesting stuff is going to happen in sort of five, ten years down the line when we start seeing recovery of these populations of species. My role in the project is to look at the genetics of uh, kelp populations in the area. Over the summer, we've had a team of divers snipping little pieces of kelp that we can then do our genetic analysis with. We really want to understand how the remnant populations we have in Sussex are related to um, wider populations across the south coast. Understanding where those are coming from is an important part of um, managing the recovery process. We're looking at a small section of kelp frond. You can see the little twinkly stars. These are tiny kelp spores. Little baby kelp emerging from the parent plant. These little spores have got an exciting uh, adventure ahead of them. As autumn comes, the kelp start to reproduce. They release millions of spores into the water. Mixing with the plankton, the tiny kelplets will be swept far and wide by the currents. They can travel hundreds of miles. As storms pound the coast, mixing up nutrients and oxygen, it creates the perfect conditions for them to grow and then settle on the seabed. It's why we're optimistic that we hopefully will see a kelp recovery in the future, but it's also why it's really important that we understand where this mother load of kelp spores is going to come from. And that might be more than one location, but um, multiple locations is going to be really good for genetic diversity in these populations. The more genetically diverse we see, the better chance we've got of a long and healthy and sustained recovery. Globally, kelp covers five times the area of coral reefs. It's declining four times faster than our tropical forest. Here in Sussex, we've got 4% of the kelp that we had back in the 80s. Given the current climate crisis, understanding the role of kelp in storing carbon is of huge interest to us all. I've been doing a lot of work on blue carbon with a specific focus on kind of mangroves, seagrasses and salt margin. And we know quite well how much carbon is locked away in those blue carbon ecosystems. We just don't know for kelp. We know that it's a highly productive ecosystem, i.e. it locks away lots of carbon very rapidly in its biomass. But what happens to that carbon after the biomass starts to break down, which we don't know. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking the first of a series of cores from 40 sites uh, around the, the sort of near shore Sussex coastline. We're going to be diving to about 25 metres, banging the cores in, digging them down, and then uh, removing them and bringing them back up to the surface for analysis. Those cores will tell us how much kelp carbon is actually locked away in the sediment. Oh. Yeah. Amazing visibility. 
got the course. Which is great. Yeah. So that's uh, about 50 centimetres uh, of sediment and we're suspecting that's going to be about 150 years worth of uh, carbon deposition in this area. If we do find that carbon locked away in those nearshore sediments, we'll be able to identify exactly what areas that's in and potentially think about extending that uh, level of protection that we have in this nearshore area. Understanding the role kelp plays as a carbon conveyor and in climate change is key. But what's happened here in Sussex is also an urgent wake-up that we must protect more of the UK seabed. Healthy kelp forests generate life, oxygenate the water and support sustainable inshore fisheries. They are vital for our future. After decades of trawling, biodiversity in Sussex is severely depleted. Sussex University is establishing a baseline of exactly what species are here. So every single creature underwater um, gives out its fingerprint, its DNA, and we can collect water sample in different locations and we can capture their presence. So thanks to this technique, we're actually able to have an idea of all the little creatures that are swimming along our coast. We have selected our um, sites in order to match the um, trolling exclusion zones. So we started from Seaford to Shoreham to Bognor Rocks and then Selsea Bill. And we also have a bit of a control sample area, which is Low Wolf Cove in Dorset. So this area is still healthy, still where we see the kelp, and we are hoping that Sussex is going to look like that. And we've actually just received um, the analysis of the samples that we collected over spring. We have the 42 species of fish that we have, um, were able to detect. We have sea bass, for example, which is a commercially important species. We have cod species and we have sprats. So these are quite um, expected. And also we have nine different species of decapods, crabs and lobsters. So this is very exciting. So this is our baseline. We have an idea of what it is that we have now, and we're hoping that the habitat and the species there are going to improve. This kind of technology is absolutely mesmerizing because from the small sample of water, we can actually have an idea of all the creatures that are swimming in the area. The eDNA findings are backed up by static camera surveys at sites all along the Sussex coast. Today we're out um, just off Selsey Bill here. We're going to deploy this baited remote underwater video and we're going to drop it in the seabed for about an hour. It's got a little bit of mackerel on the front to attract some uh, fish. It's got three cameras on it that record what species we see. Look at that, beautiful. It's really, really clear today. We've planted out in 28 different sites here on the Sussex coast so far. We've got an idea that uh, some of the most common species that we see are like conger eels, for example, cat sharks. It seems quite depleted. We'd expect probably to see a bit more. We're seeing what we may think is the middle predators are dominating the environment. It, this is theoretical. We've got to analyse the data fully with the students uh, and have a look. But really, we'd like to see some of the top predators come back. We'll be monitoring it over the next few years. Uh, hopefully recovery is what we're expecting to see. As summer draws to a close, IFCA and the Sussex University team head to a new survey area that has never been trawled. What they find is extraordinary, a 
and gives real hope for Sussex waters. We're going along a transect at the moment. We're going through some really healthy looking patches of kelp right now. It's some of the best I've seen. It's really exciting. There's quite a lot of coverage down here. And there's even some inquisitive bottlenose dolphins that have come to have a look as well. Dolphins! Dolphins! Well, I just saw three or four going past the screen. Um, and from what I can hear outside, it sounds like there's quite a lot outside jumping around. But it's pretty crazy. We're here on a good day. I think it's a pretty special, special spot. And I think if we're going to see any natural kelp recovery, then these natural populations are going to be really important for, for sourcing that. This is actually the first time I've seen such a large kelp bed here in Sussex. It gives me great hope. I think now we've taken some of the pressures off, we're going to see nature really restoring and bouncing back. coastline has a future and the chance to restore we're at the beginning of an incredible journey and the kelp won't recover overnight but what happens here and what we gain in understanding will have a huge impact across the whole of the uk At a time of ecological and climate crisis, we have to restore nature at scale. This project is a shining example of that. Okay, so um, on behalf of the Sussex ISCA, um, I'm delighted to be here today and participate in this unique event organised by the Wildlife Trust and obviously the Sussex Kelp Restoration Partnership. Um, before I dive into the detail of the, the title here, I think it's useful for me to provide very swiftly a bit of background on who the ISCA are, um, how we plan towards sustainable fisheries, um, the scope of, uh, of management that we've undertaken since our establishment in 2010, and then the near shore trawling bylaw itself, and then I'll get on to um, these opportunities and outcomes that we're, we're hoping for. So, there are 10 ESCAs around the coast of England. Uh, we were established in 2010, as I say, under the Marine and Coastal Access Act. There's one association of ESCAs that represents the 10 statutory bodies. Uh, the Sussex Ifco is one of the smallest um, and covers the entire coastal extent of Sussex from Chichester Harbour in the west to Rye Bay in the east. Uh, we're funded through Sussex uh, County Council and Brighton and Hove City Council. And our duties are to manage fisheries and fishing activities within marine protected areas. This chart shows the significant ports or landing locations within the district and the extent of both the three and the six nautical mile limit. The Sussex Ithaca district extends to six nautical miles and that covers an area of about 550 square miles, nautical miles. Um, so, the authority has a strategic approach to planning and implementation of its um, fisheries management and marine conservation management uh, duties. And uh, the principles that are used for the management 
includes use of the best available evidence. Now, in doing that, we're working with um, both universities, NGOs, uh, lots been mentioned about citizen science, we make good use of that, and of course our own internal work that we do with our own research, with our own individual uh, members of staff who uh, we'll be talking a little bit later. Um, we take an ecosystem approach to management, and you've heard a lot about ecosystems at the moment, so um, obviously this is uh, you know, as opposed to a single stock approach to management, we're looking at the entirety of the environment. Um, we support low impact fisheries within the district. Um, we recognise the practical constraints for fishers, both commercial and recreational. Uh, it's a pretty hostile place out there sometimes, and if you're a small inshore boat, then actually the distance that you can travel and the days on which you can fish can be limited. Just for reference, uh, in the uh, district, we don't allow any vessels bigger than 14 metres to fish at all, and the majority of vessels are under 10 metres in length. Um, we consult closely with uh, communities and ensure that we undertake partnership working. Um, instrumental to our work is our long-term strategy on uh, data collection, so this is one example uh, that we spend a lot of time on, and that's the collection of fishing activity information. And these charts here and the data on them just illustrate the extent, extent of certain types of fishing activity in relation to, or the boundary of the new trawling uh, exclusion area in the west of the district. So, uh, yeah, so obviously it uh, explains what they are. Top left is potting with intensity high in the dark blue. Uh, netting, you can see the intensity uh, in the bottom right is more to the east of the district of Shoreham and Brighton. The other thing we spend a lot of time doing, or that I don't, but the team spend a lot of time doing probably, is um, looking at uh, marine habitats. So first of all, talking about seabed diversity, Sussex has a tremendous diversity of seabed sites, um, right through from soft sediments and sand, uh, to rocky reef in the bottom right. Uh, in a general, uh, generally speaking, the further east you go, uh, the more sedimentary the nature of the, the uh, seabed. So we do. That's why you tend to find clearer water if you're diving. You probably would focus more on diving off Selsey than I think Rye Bay. Now these combined with the life form uh, diversity uh, information that we collect through a whole range of drop-down cameras, video shows, and so forth, um, provide further information to put with that geology. And uh, the geology of seabed is instrumental in defining the life forms that are upon it. It's like a terrestrial environment where you've got chalk, you have alkaline species, um, you have similar sort of relationship in, in the sea, and that's already been, I think, mentioned in terms of the relationship between hard substrates and kelp previously. And there's a good example in the middle at the top. You've got a bit of kelp there on a hard substrate. Interestingly, down the bottom right, you've got a bit of chalk with some piddocks in. Piddocks are mollusks that drill into the chalk. And if you're down on the beach and you find a chunk of chalk that looks like a bit of Swiss cheese, that's because it's been drilled out by piddocks over the years and it's been washed ashore. So these sets of data are combined to form our uh, habitat maps that we've developed. Um, and this is instrumental to our fisheries management. Um, this is a long-term data set that we put together, and we've undertaken some very um, significant um, projects in terms of interpretation of, in of acoustic uh, hydrographic information, which has then been uh, interpreted and, the, and ground truth against uh, some of the um, surveys that have been done by divers and underwater cameras. And this gives us an amazing uh, uh, habitat map. If you want to look at this, it is actually available through our website. And even better, you can click on some of those uh, points and you will actually be able to see a video show or something similar. So, we've been around since 2010. And since 2013 to 21, we've been introducing a range of bylaws in accordance with our strategic planning. Um, they cover a whole range of things, including NPA management. But the one we're all focused on here today is the near shore trawling bylaw that was made in 2019 by the IFCA, 
When it's made, it then goes through public consultation. And obviously, it was absolutely fabulous to have the support of uh, the Help Our Health campaign and uh, the lobbying that was put into DEFRA as well to ultimately end up with that bylaw being signed off. Um, so, moving on to the bylaw, we've seen this map a few times. So, the entire area covers some 300 square kilometres of near shore waters. Obviously, the main part of the uh, bylaw is uh, an area extending four kilometres seaward uh, between Shoreham and uh, Chelsea Bill. But significantly, it does cover Chichester Harbour as well, and obviously extends throughout the entire district and covers some of the important short reef features along Beachy Head. So, let's get on to the potential fisheries improvements and outcomes. Uh, we, we do expect uh, benefits that are anticipated for both fish and shellfish stocks, and I'll provide examples of each. The shellfish fisheries are very important in Sussex. As part of the management, management we collect uh, shellfish data. The slide illustrates uh, 2020 landings. Uh, the majority of the landings by weight are in whelk, and that's about 1,000 tonnes. Uh, much smaller by weight is cuttlefish at about 140 tonnes and lobster at 10 tonnes. But those two species obviously are far more valuable than whelk. Um, but what we've seen in recent years is a decline in both lobster and cuttlefish catches, which obviously um, we'll get on to. So, um, the overall impact, we hope, of the uh, bylaw, the intention of it, is to uh, recover, uh, intended to support recovery of these fisheries for improvements to populations and stock biomass and the fishable component of the stock. Improved habitats provide the following uh, physiological benefits. Better food web structures and feeding opportunities on prey species. Protection from predation. Uh, a good example is the elasmogranic species are quite uh, uh, adapt at finding uh, crustacea that are going through their selling uh, process. It's called excisis. Um, when they're nice and soft, and obviously good to eat. Uh, improved reduction and juvenile recruitment, uh, reduced disturbance and stress from trawling, uh, which actually in turn improves growth. That's uh, in terms of reducing stress. That's been shown with scallops. Uh, and the management of trawling will also result in a reduction in discarding and the associated mortality for juvenile black bream and bats. So, cuttlefish migrate inshore into Sussex waters in April to May and spawn using natural or unnatural seabed structures on which to lay their eggs. So the lower image uh, of the cuttlefish trap shows the presence of great white bunches of uh, eggs on it. Kelp is an ideal natural habitat onto which the cuttlefish will lay eggs. And reductions in populations and associated catches of cuttlefish are expected to improve in those areas in which trawling pressure has been removed and habitat recovery enabled. As a target species, bat is extremely important in inshore fisheries, um, and we expect considerable benefit for the non trawl fisheries within the district. Bats rely on inshore habitats for the first five years of their life before they mature uh, into adult fish. Um, and protection of the natural harbours in Sussex, such as Chichester and the neutral areas, ensure improved environmental conditions for bass and associated benefits for bass populations in their fisheries. And I think it's been uh, uh, explained on a number of occasions in the talks the huge benefit that uh, kelp beds have for uh, juvenile fish, and uh, bass are an absolutely key species in the area. Um, the decline in pair trawling effort will also result in an improvement in recruitment due to uh, a, a, a large reduction in bycatch mortality, which now occurs. Another thing for species that is very well known in Sussex is the black bream. The spawning stock migrates inshore uh, in a, about April and May. And, uh, and a unique and well-documented nesting, nesting behaviour occurs over suitable substrates. And there's some photographs here. Um, 
I won't go into too much detail because there isn't time, but it basically the male makes the nest, gets together with the female, lays the eggs on the area, and then the male uh, guards uh, the area and will see off any uh, intruder. As you can see in the bottom right, there's a rat being pounded away. Um, large areas of spawning grounds were previously trawled to target these spawning aggregations, and the new trawling management has already resulted in significant benefits in, in this year's spawning stock with an estimated reduction of mortality in the order of 50 metric tons of fish, which probably is in the order of 30 to 50,000 fish, uh, which are some of the mature spawning animals. Um, the future, uh, uh -oh, there we go. The future for black, bream, for black sea bream and their sustainable fisheries in Sussex looks a good deal brighter. In future, larger stocks will be available from May to September for inshore static year fisheries, this may include net, line, or perhaps trap caught fish. The recreational fishing sector could also benefit and considerable charter, considerable Sussex charter, the considerable Sussex charter fishing, fishing fleet based in Littlehampton, Shoreham, and Brighton uh, will have greater opportunities to fish for these prized fish. And there's a chap who's obviously extremely proud with what he's caught in the bottom right. In those areas where trawling trawling could still occur, the potential for catching bream should improve and bycatch reduce because we've also uh, increased mesh sizes on cod ends as well. And finally, further benefits, which uh, I'll just touch on quickly, other fin fish such as cod, dover sole and various ray species should show, show improvements in populations. The potential regeneration of populations of oysters near shore that were present in extensive beds and supported the prolific consumption of oysters in the 1800s. None of us can remember it, but it, it's actually there used to be a huge trade in oysters being um, caught off Sussex and shipped up to London, uh, as obviously it was a staple food then. Um, we've also got uh, migratory uh, fish within our coastal zone, the sea trout. We have uh, rivers with sea trout runs, uh, the Aran, the Ada, the Ouse, um, and these trout live in coastal waters and obviously will benefit as well from the prolific um, abundance of food within coast beds. Um, and finally, supporting the recovery of some of our most rare and charismatic fish species. And this chap at the bottom right is um, a bit difficult to get the scale, but that's an angel shark. Um, they are fairly large. Um, and um, they were once common uh, off Sussex. Um, and now uh, we get the odd report, a very, very, very occasional report of maybe a juvenile. So hopefully uh, there's an opportunity there. So I will leave you with the thought that the community needs to know more about and support local sustainable fisheries. The New Shore Trawling Bylaw provides an opportunity to demonstrate how inshore fisheries can flourish in Sussex whilst protecting and restoring our most valuable marine habitats. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for the invite, Sally, and the Sussex Pet Restoration Project. It's great to be here and talk to some actual people in a room instead of to a screen. Um, so I'm going to give a bit of an overview of just the surveys and the monitoring work the ISCA are doing to monitor impacts from the nearshore trawling bylaw. So as Tim and a few others have already mentioned, this is part of um, the ISCA's move to an ecosystem-based approach to management. So this methodology of fisheries management includes the whole ecosystem from the, uh, from the eggs to the larvae to the adults and the juvenile fish and shellfish species. And it does that by protecting the habitats that are essential for the different life stages of these species. And the reason for this is so that we can ensure healthy and productive and resilient ecosystem services and that provide the services and resources that we want and need for now and into the future. So on this slide is a, just a, a simple uh, image of our district, which is in white here. And you can see the trawling exclusion area, which just is this narrow strip along the coast. And this was defined by, as Tim mentioned, we did extensive habitat mapping work. And from that habitat mapping work, we were able to map the environmental value of different parts of that district. 
and also how sensitive different habitats were to cooling to come up with this exclusion area. And of course, part of the zone includes where we, where there was historic kelp beds between Selby and Shoreham. So the goal of all of the surveys and monitoring that I'm going to be giving a brief overview in a second is to give a picture of how the ecosystem is currently functioning, providing a baseline for what it looks like um, if at the beginning of this habitat restoration journey, and what we hope it will do is show how it changes going into the future. And most of the projects that are monitoring this are collaborative, so I'm just going to focus on the ones that we are leading on and leave others to, to go into the detail with the others. So one of the key pieces of work that the ISCA is doing is doing annual code video transects, and we've been doing these since 2019. And these are a really important pre-management baseline data set for what the benthic habitat looks like pre-management. And we focus these, there's a number of transects which you can see um, here, these little purple lines of the transects, and they've been chosen where we know that there was historic kelp growth and also outside that historic um, kelp growth and inside and outside the trawling exclusion zone. This is the setup we're using. So we've got a the code video sledge with lights and lasers, which are set of different parts so that you can be sure of the size of the things that you're, you're measuring down there. And of course, it's got a camera and we've got a GoPro attached to it as well to back up. And this is it being deployed by a couple of our officers from our ship Watchful. Um, and you also saw some footage in that great film that we just saw from Big Waves section, um, where we showed some footage that we captured from our ROV, which was kindly funded by the Environment Agency to help us monitor this work. And this is a really useful tool because you can use it in different areas where you can't put a code video sledge in. It's much a bit more manoeuvrable and able to access more different types of environments. So I just wanted to show you a few bits of, bits of results from our code video uh, surveys. Uh, so this uses, we, we partner with the Zoological Society of London with uh, Chris Yeson, who is going to be talking in a minute, who does the analysis for us on this. And they take images every 30 seconds from the videos that we provide. And then from those images, the seaweeds and animals are grouped and analysed, and the percentage of algal cover <laughs> is defined as well. And I'm just going to show you a few results, but obviously we can't really draw any real conclusions from these at the moment because it's just a couple of years worth of data, but I thought it would be interesting just to show you what we've been seeing. Um, so, I mean, it, it, we've heard a lot about the decline of the kelp, so we actually haven't seen any kelp in our code video surveys in the historic area. What we have seen is an increase in the number of annotations of, so of, of algae and other organisms, also an increase in chlorophyllum in the number of transects, that's a type of algae, um, increase in abundance of fine red algae, but a decline in other red algae. But as I said, these, this is two years worth of data and there are lots of natural variations as to why this could be occurring. Um, but, it's, but yeah, there's a couple of images here. Um, this is transit 23, where you can see the increase of chlorophyllum between the two years. And then in the bottom pictures here, that's another transect where there's an increase in the abundance of fine red algae. So it'll be really interesting to see as we go on, and we're going to continue to do these surveys annually, to see what benefits to habitat restoration that we see from the bylaw. And if anyone's interested in reading more about those transects, we've got a fact sheet available on our website, which we're hoping that by putting that out there, other researchers can come in and do research in the same kind of location so we can put all of that together and like, use this ecosystem-based approach to try and understand how the ecosystem is changing. So Tim mentioned our shellfish permit bylaw as well. So that's been in place since 2016 and has recreational and commercial permits. And the fishers have to submit catch returns uh, monthly, and that gives us an idea of the total weight and landings per unit effort, which uh, we can use that to look at how that varies across the district. So each of those different colours is a different species. We've got whelk in blue, cuttlefish in green, edible crab in red, and lobster in pink. And you can see how much of each of those species is, is, across, is caught across the district. This data is from 2020, and we've now got four years worth of data. So again, this is this kind of data will be a really good indicator of 
how any habitat restoration and kelp growth will help increase the catchable stock of our local fisheries, hopefully. And we can also have a look at the seasonality of these different species from the data. And as I mentioned, we've got four years' worth of data, so we can see how the different species are doing as a result from this catch return data. So lobsters haven't been doing well for the last four years. Welk, it's a bit varied. Uh, cuttlefish had a good year last year. So this type of data will be really useful going forward. So we also do small fish surveys around the district. So I've heard the term essential fish habitat has been mentioned a few times today. So part of the ecosystem-based approach to habitat management is creating the type of habitat that allow the juveniles to thrive. So by conducting these small fish surveys, we're getting an indicator of what the juvenile stock looks like, which will then hopefully, if we see any improvements in that, will then translate into the catchable stock in a few years' time. So for this data we've got over for this survey we've got over ten years worth of data. A lot of that's from Chichester Harbour. We've also got data from Medmory and Rye across the district. Uh, these are collaborative projects. We used to run them ourselves, but now we work closely with other organisations such as Barshelt College. That's where these pictures are from. Um, and if any group is interested in doing these fish surveys, then please come and talk to me um, and we can help you get set up because it'll be really great to continue collecting as much of this data as possible. So I also mentioned in the first slide about uh, larvae and eggs and how they can be a good indicator of ecosystem health. So we are hoping next spring to start a collaboration with the University of Portsmouth, which will look at eggs and larval recruitment. And this will be a really good indication of, it will be an early indication of any ecosystem improvement that we would be able to see before any, any of the like later indicators, like, uh, like increases in total weight for landings or landings per unit effort. Uh, another project that I just wanted to highlight that we are hoping to start in the spring next year as well is with it's the fish in, we're going to collaborate with the Fish Intel project with the University of Plymouth. Um, this is an acoustic array which is being it's, it's a big European project and if you can have, if you can see the map down here that shows all the locations for these arrays and here's Sussex as a case study. And this an acoustic array is where you put receivers in parts of the sea and then you tag fish with acoustic tags, and then when the fish go around the array, then it pings to let you know that they're there. So we're hoping that we can use these to monitor the movements of bass, pollock, black sea bream, and hopefully undulate ray, which are all quite key species for this for this dis for our district. And from that, we'll be able to look at habitat use of those species, and also site fidelity, which is how long they hang out in the different areas. Uh, that's it for the projects I was going to mention. If anyone's got any questions, there's a Q&A session later or come and find me. Hi there. Uh, so I'm uh, uh, Raymond Ward from the University of Brighton. Um, I'll be talking a bit about blue carbon. I'm just going to make a quick mention of a couple of my colleagues as well, Ian Hendy uh, and Mika Peck, who sadly couldn't be here today. Um, that, so there's basically there's a, a group of uh, local universities that are conducting a range of different um, uh, research. Uh, so University of Brighton, there, University of Portsmouth, and University of Sussex. Uh, so Mika, as you would have seen in the film, he's leading uh, on a lot of the eDNA research together with uh, Valentina Scarponi, who's just over here, uh, and uh, Ian Hendy is working together with me uh, on this blue carbon project together with Mika. So we've got kind of quite a good uh, collaboration from the, from the universities there. Now, uh, the work from uh, Brighton and these sort of local universities started about 10 years ago, actually, uh, with that, the initial setup of that kind of uh, substrate map and habitat map of the local area that kind of sort of spearheaded this. Uh, and it's kind of slowly led on to, to, to where we are today, where we've got this excellent... Uh, uh, no trawling bylaw uh, that was um, put forward by uh, Sussex IFCA. So, um, when we talk about blue carbon, what do we mean by blue carbon? Well, we've, we've, we've got sort of various pools of carbon uh, dotted around. We've got the atmospheric pool, that's the one that's getting bigger at the moment. Uh, we've got our oceanic pool, 
uh, uh, which is very, very large, as you can see there, a geological pool, which is slightly more stable, uh, a soil pool, and our biotic pool. Uh, there's quite a large biotic pool in this room at the moment, that's, that's just you guys. Uh, but it's basically, we're talking about things that are alive, which I think hopefully will last. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then we've got a soil pool, which is really quite important as well. That's something that we're constantly contributing to. Uh, geological pool, as I mentioned, fairly stable. An oceanic pool, that really, really big one that's absorbing uh, a large amount of that kind of atmospheric carbon. Now, this is really important from a sort of climate change mitigation perspective. Now, uh, 25 to 33 percent, depending on what papers you read, uh, of atmospheric carbon is taken up by our oceans. That's that's a really, really important ecosystem service. Uh, and large proportions uh, are stored in our vegetative coastal systems. They're the ones that I love. Um, so here I've got some pictures I've got there, uh, salt marshes, uh, sea grasses, and our mangroves. And they're the ones that we know fairly well uh, how much carbon is stored. We've been developing uh, uh, metrics for actually evaluating how much carbon is stored, the rates of uh, of carbon sequestration, uh, and getting an idea of the sources of the carbon as well. Now, uh, those three habitats that I mentioned, the sea grasses, the mangroves, and the salt marshes, they've got really large soil stocks. Now, we look at our kelp, and we have done really, really excellent presentation explaining how excellent they are at absorbing carbon into their biomass, okay? So the, the question mark uh, that Hilma Pippa had on their, uh, their presentation was, where does it go? Well, there's no soils in the kelp. You've got basically got hold fast onto uh, rock or, or some other kind of hard substrate. So where does it go? And it starts to break down. It goes somewhere else. We, we don't really know. So that's um, something that we're really, really interested in, uh, in, in finding out. Now, sources of blue carbon, I've said, got all these kind of interactions between those various different pools. Some of it that's uh, locked away in our marine sediments could be coming from terrestrial sources. Okay, it could be coming from uh, land use practices, so it could be coming from farming, it could be coming from forestry, runoff of organic material and deposition into our near shore uh, coastal zone or, or deeper sediments. It could be filamentous green algae, that, that stuff that you don't really want to be uh, swimming in too much could be from kelp, okay? And, that, and that's, that's kind of what we're, we're interested in, in finding out, how much of what's locked away in our marine sediments is actually from kelp. Could be from coralline red algae, could be from other kind of marine uh, um, uh, biota, or it could be kind of from our uh, sort of near shore uh, coastal systems, our salt marshes or, uh, or our sea grasses, okay? Our current situation, I feel like I might be repeating myself, because <laughs> everyone's kind of said the same thing. Almost all the extensive kelp in South East England has been lost in the last 40 years. Eric's excellent uh, film produced by uh, Sarah Cunliffe has, has showed that really clearly. Ithaca did a really good presentation on that. We've got roughly about 4% left. Okay? We don't know how much uh, kelp contributes to sedimentary blue carbon. Now, as Dan said, it locks it away in that biomass. But what happens afterwards? How much of what is actually stored in our marine system is actually from the, from the kelp itself? And how much is from other sources? Okay, we don't know. How much is even in that marine sediment? We've, we've got a rough idea for some areas, not too much for our local area. And we don't know how this has changed over time. And that's really, really important. Is this, uh, the kelp that we've got uh, at the moment and the kelp that we've had in the past has that contributed substantially to stable carbon stocks, okay, in our marine system? We also, we don't know how much is stored there, but we also don't know, are there any carbon hotspots? Or is a lot of this actually being stored in the sediments, the trawlers come along, they re-release it, it starts to break down, particularly if it's quite labile. So we don't know what, what, where, where the carbon is, and what are those sort of major uh, um, uh, areas of, uh, of storage? Okay, so uh, there's a picture of a <laughs> screenshot that I grabbed off of uh, Sarah Cunliffe of uh, me hammering in a core. And that's some of the work that we've been doing over this last year. Let's get an idea of how much carbon is stored 
in our marine sediments and find out what the rates are of this uh, carbon sequestration. Okay? So we've been caught, we're going to go out, we've already done some coring. We're going to be coring to about 70 metres depth, so there's quite a lot of area. Now, we're going down to do sort of dive surveys, so we get sort of fairly sort of impact uh, cores. Uh, we're going to be doing radio neutralization. What does that mean? <laughs> um, so what we're doing is we're going to be, uh, uh, everyone I guess broadly knows what carbon dating is. We're going to be using, so carbon dating works really well over longer time periods, but we want to know what's kind of happened in our kind of, uh, our time periods of, of sort of climate change. So then we're thinking sort of 150 years, okay? So there's a, a, a natural radionuclide called lead 210 that we can use to give us really fine scale uh, data uh, and be, allow us to actually date those, uh, those sediments, okay? Then we're going to be looking at stable isotope analysis. Now, stable isotopes of carbon and nitrogen have a, a, each kind of biota has its specific signature. So we can get an idea of what the sources of the carbon are that we find in these cores and also get an idea of how that's changed over time. Has it actually, uh, back in the 80s when, uh, when Eric quite clearly mentioned there was loads of kelp, when we've got that date for the 80s, is there suddenly a larger signature of kelp carbon or not? Okay, so the stable isotope analysis will allow us to do that. We're also going to be uh, using eDNA. So I think Valentina in the video really clearly mentioned what that is. So everything's kind of shedding a bit of DNA, particularly if you go in the water. So I might pick up some divers, uh, or I might pick up uh, fish, or I might pick up kelp. Okay? And we can see how that has changed over time. Okay? And then we're obviously going to be doing what is sort of fairly standard for, for sort of carbon uh, evaluations, and that's uh, to do a direct measurement of the biomass to see how how that's actually uh, changing as we as we go towards that kind of development of a, a fairly sort of healthy and stable kind of kelp uh, system. Thanks, Ray, and thanks, uh, Sally, for uh, uh, inviting me. Um, uh, so, uh, again, I'm, I'm going to talk a, a bit about um, the work that we're mostly planning to do, and we've kind of made some stop starts at um, looking at... Uh, of genetic diversity of uh, kelp in the area and, and trying to fit that in the context of, of the wider South Coast. Um, so when we say kelp, um, as, 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 as Dan and Pip mentioned earlier in their, in their talk, there's, there's more than one species that we think of uh, 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 as, as kelp, and uh, there are four species that we see uh, specifically in Sussex. Uh, this, these are screenshot from the uh, uh, lovely um, research book on um, um, kelp in the, around the UK. Uh, there are four species. There's the kind of commercially grown um, sugar kelp, uh, which is the kind of long, wavy blade. And then there's the kind of palm oak kelp, the, the, the kind of big palm-shaped things with the uh, site, um, uh, including fur bellows, which is the, the, the wavy edge um, site. And then you've got the two laminaria species, and so when we kind of think about um, monetary genetic diversity, which of the kelp do we mean? Well, ideally all of them, but we've got to make a start somewhere. And so we're going to start with the laminarias, so the two on, on the left. And these are the really kind of big habitat-forming kelp uh, of the historic kelp beds here. And so we're, we're starting to focus on those. So uh, the, these two laminaria species are actually geographically quite widespread. Uh, so, uh, sorry, it's, it's not a great map, but the, the kind of yellow blobs um, show the, the distribution. And so the two laminaria species are widespread around the UK coast, um, as we saw earlier, but they also extend up into the coast of Norway, uh, up into Iceland, and uh, the, the all-weed laminaria species is even in um, North America. And so we kind of uh, uh, have to set what we see in Sussex within that kind of wider context. So uh, uh, genetics, uh, I don't want to go too much into uh, uh, detail here, but we can do quite a lot of different things with the genetic tools available at the, uh, at the moment. 
And the first thing we can do is when we go out and dive, uh, we, we can see this kind of really big and nice um, 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 kelp, but often we see really small baby kelp, and they're a lot harder to distinguish. They're kind of out snorkeling, and uh, you see these kind of tiny little single blades with a little start, um, and you can't necessarily tell which species they are, but you can snip a little piece off, and we can look in the lab, and we can kind of gen genetically confirm, oh, it's this species, and that's really important if we're going to try and monitor these things. But um, uh, the, the point I'm trying to make with this slide is that we can actually look at very different scales depending on the kind of kind of genetic lens that we use. We can see bigger picture things like how does this species relate to this other species in kind of evolutionary time. And then we can go all the way down to, okay, who's this um, kelp parent um, uh, in, in the same way that we can kind of use genetics to, to identify uh, people's parents. And, and where, where we're trying to sit is somewhere in the middle where we're trying to look at population. So how does this patch of kelp relates to other patches in the kind of near areas and, and the south coast. <coughs> so uh, as kind of scientists, I'm going to start out by saying, well, what are the questions that I'm really trying to answer um, by, by doing this work? And it's really kind of saying, how genetically isolated are the remnants of kelp that we see in Sussex uh, relative to the wider areas, you know, are they, you know, closely related to uh, uh, Benbridge or Isle of Wight or, you know, uh, further uh, 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 to the east? Uh, we don't really know. Um, are there potential populations that might be really good sources for, to, to aid recovery? You know, are, are, are there a bunch of spores that are going to kind of chip in? Uh, where are they going to come from? And uh, the, the other thing is, is We've got four species, and each of those might uh, create different habitats. And can we treat them all of the same if we just do one of these species? Does that mean we know everything about all the other kelp? Well, probably not. And so we want to actually tell the difference. Okay, uh, uh, different spawning times, uh, different uh, 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 characteristics that might mean we need to be treating these different species differently. So uh, there's a little bit of previous work on on this, and. Uh, I, I intend to be using these um, genetic tools called microsatellite markers that allow, uh, allow us to do kind of population level work. And here are two studies, recent studies, looking at the Orwe uh, that have sampled uh, populations around uh, the kind of broader geographic scale. And so this, this work on the right is uh, actually uh, Dan and uh, Pip uh, contributed to, uh, which is looking at the southwest coast. But there, there hasn't really been much collection and uh, assessment of. Uh, the always along the south coast, anything uh, east of um, uh, uh, Plymouth, uh, except for one little survey that we did a couple of years ago with colleagues uh, Juliet Brody and uh, Gary Barker from um, Bristol. Um, we, we described three uh, populations and tried to use this um, high-resolution genetic tool called um, uh, uh, Brad sequencing. Um, uh, Turned out that they're really difficult to work with, but it, what, it, what it told us was that uh, actually the southeast is very different to the southwest, uh, uh, and, and uh, that kind of made us think, well, okay, where does Sussex fit within this kind of um, uh, uh, gradient? <coughs> with the as soon as you start to go underwater, the the already kind of quite shallow species and the tangleweed, the the the, the Laminaria hyperborea is a deep water species that makes it harder to collect. We've got to go diving to get to, to get them. So there's not been as much work on that. But there, here are some studies uh, uh, from Ireland and, and Norway, and they kind of show this uh, pattern of okay, if you're nearby populations, they're very likely to be closely related to each other, and then as you get further away, you, you're going to have uh, more genetic divergence, which is kind of the pattern that we would expect. Um, but it means that. You know, um, uh, the, 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 the pop source populations are probably going to be nearby. Uh, I'm just going to briefly touch on the kind of aborted work that we did. Um, I, I had an intern, uh, Dan Iconto, uh, who got to, uh, sponsored by the People Trust for Endangered Species to, to start this um, uh, uh, collection work along the South Coast. And we went out and collected, and we did some DNA extraction, and we did some uh, genetic uh, identification to, to confirm species. And then 
COVID happened and all of our samples basically got locked up at the Natural History Museum for three or four months. And then, then I got offered a PhD and, and then we had to wait six months to get any genetic um, 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 plastic wear for our labs and we just we basically got stuck for a bit. Uh, and so hopefully now um, uh, we are in a position to actually get on with the work. Uh, and so here's a picture of uh, Kevin Hopkins, a colleague of mine at the zoo, who's uh, our lab technician, who's uh, about to get started on uh, actually doing the, the, the genotyping of these samples. And uh, as Ray said earlier, um, uh, uh, guys have been going out in um, uh, uh, along the south coast and collecting over the summer. And uh, you can see on these maps here, we've collected uh, about 400 samples now. Um, a, a big thanks, especially, especially to Mita and to other colleagues uh, uh, to, uh, uh, with, within the, the, the Cat Restoration Project who've been um, uh, sending me samples, uh, uh, particularly kind of random you know, things coming up in the post. And uh, um, Sarah sent me this, uh, this, 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 this big bulging thing, and I opened it up, and there's a nappy. And in, opened up the nappy. What is brown mess inside this nappy? Oh, it's a bunch of kelp. Thank you very much, sir. Um, so it, it's great that so many people have been kind of very um, enthusiastic about sending me samples, and uh, hopefully we'll be in, in a position very soon to uh, uh, actually start genotyping them and talking about the, how, how our populations sit within the, the, the wider context. And so, just to finish by saying a big thank you to uh, uh, everyone that, that's uh, uh, contributed to this work. Uh, and uh, that's all. Hi, everyone. I'm Morgan Robertson, and I'm a senior project manager with the Blue Moon Foundation. I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. And I'm going to be sharing a little bit about the work that we've been doing across the UK to support low impact fisheries, but also here in Sussex. So for those of you that don't know, Blue is a marine conservation charity. We were set up in 2010 um, off the back of the film called The End of the Line. It really popped the crisis, popped the lid on the crisis of overfishing in our oceans. And ever since then, Blue has been working globally to tackle this problem. We work in some really incredible places uh, and we deliver a um, wide range of programs that try to create large scale marine catch areas and manage them properly. Um, restore habitats and species that are on the brink of collapse, um, and also tackle some of the worst things happening at sea, such as pulse fishing. One of the biggest projects that we work on is trying to develop and support sustainable models of fishing. This is really um, centered around a belief that small-scale fisheries, low-impact fisheries, when done right, using the right kinds of gear, should really um, be able to thrive and um, coexist with conservation. Um, over 75% of the UK's fishing fleet operate with boats under 10 metres in size. And we heard Tim tell us just how much this is a reflection of the fisheries across Sussex in this district. Many of the fisheries here in Sussex are really tiny boats with not even a little kind of cabin over the top of them, and many of them still push themselves off of kind of single beaches to go out to sea. Um, this kind of this way of fishing is extremely challenging and dangerous. They are bound by the weather and tides. Um, but these kind of fisheries are also suffering across the UK. Declining fish stocks, increased pressure on fishing grounds, gear conflict, uh, no access to things like quota and climate change. It's all making it really hard for small-scale sustainable fisheries to continue. We see a national decline um, in numbers across the UK. Through Blue's work, we try to work with fishermen across the UK to come up with solutions, to get them involved in research, involved in conservation and restoration projects, and so that they should not only be part of this and have a voice in the way conservation and voice um, in, in terms of how conservation areas should be managed, but they should also benefit from it, their livelihood should be an improvement. I'm going to firstly talk a bit about a project that we've involved in for quite a long time, over 10 years. I'm hoping it will show you a project that's 10 years on from the journey that we're all starting here together in Sussex. So some of you might know Lyme Bay. It's a really beautiful part of, of England on the coast of Dorset and Devon. Um, in 2008, um, it was designated as a marine protected area. It covers over 300 kilometers square of really amazing pink sea sands and rocky reefs. And that's why the marine protected area was set up 
It's actually really contentious at the time when this MPA was created. That's because it completely banned trawling and dredging. And I'm actually really sad to say that today it remains one of the only MPAs we have in the UK where trawling and dredging has been completely removed from within um, the MPA's boundaries. So, yeah, it was quite a big deal at the time. And what happened was, although this is really good, we got rid of some of the most um, destructive fisheries, fisheries that were really having an impact on the seabed and, and fish stocks. And we saw something, something happen. Um, now, because we've removed trawling and dredging, there's a big increase in potting and nesting. Lots of other fishermen moved into the area because it's a safe space. And instead of seeing fishing coming down, it actually started to increase in other fisheries, particularly pot fisheries. And it's through seeing this increase in potting that local fishermen actually reached out to Blue and other people working in the area at the time and said, we're actually a bit worried here. We're worried that not only is the MPA not managing to recover, we're worried that the reef is not recovering as, it meant, as it's meant to, but our catches, our crab and lobster, things that we're really dependent on are not going up, they're actually going down. We're really worried there might be a total ban. So in response to this, Blue actually brought um, lots of people together, all the fishermen, any fishermen that wanted to be a part of it, regulators, so the ISCAS, MMO, um, Natural England, scientists, the Mid University in particular, and other NGOs, and we formed a consultative committee. That committee has met every three months for the last 10 years, and the point of that is to all come together and talk about ideas and try and manage the reserve as a collaborative group. We don't always agree, but it really provides a forum for us to get our thoughts out and find a way to go forward together. One of the first things we did was work with fishermen to put codes on, like limits on how they fish. So we put limits on the number of pots they could use, limits on the kind of length of nets, and made decisions about where they could fish. Um, and that was really important for the fishermen that they took, you know, they, re they really led this and decided what they wanted to do. Something else that we did was we started and um, fed into some research that had already been happening, but, you know, we really invested in long-term ecological and socio-economic monitoring. I think what's really important, something that Lyme Day can show for the rest of the UK, is Plymouth University has monitored it every single year using some of the techniques we've heard about today, code videos, baited underwater brugs, EGNA. And what that allows, has allowed us to do is track really carefully how that MPA is changing, how it's being impacted by that protection, but also to see whether some of the limits we were setting on fisheries were going to have an impact. Um, we also took the time to really understand from the fishermen what did they want, what was going to help them, what were their biggest problems, how could we work with them to make sure that they were benefiting from this area. And the main things that we helped them to put in place was we paid for and funded and sorted chiller units in every single port. Lime has four ports, ice making machines in all of those ports, um, and ice boxes. And that was really to try to help them get better quality fish now that you know we have this amazing MPA here. And we created a label called Reserve Seafood to um, support that and kind of champion the provenance and sustainability of what fishermen were catching. We undertook a lot of research, as I said, and I think one of the most important pieces of research was a long-term potting study that was led by Plymouth University. The aim of that potting study was to look at whether we could look at whether we could figure out a kind of sustainable threshold for potting within the MPA. One of the main reasons Blue had gotten involved was potting had gone up. We brought in a code, so the fishermen had agreed to only fish 250 pots. We wanted to figure out whether that was the right level. So we did some research, we set some areas out where we didn't pot at all, we potted really lightly, we potted medium, and then we potted like hell in some of the other areas, loads and loads of pots. And the point of that was to look at whether the seabed and also the crab and lobster stocks changed within those areas. And what we found was actually reef building species and crabs and lobsters really declined in the heavy potting areas. And we actually were able to show that the limit we, the fishermen had put in place, their limit on pots, was the right threshold. And it's for an increase in catches. And the reef species, the reason the MPA was there, were kind of coming back and flourishing in those areas. I think what's really important about this research is the value in doing research to show that fisheries can coexist within conservation areas. And this is just yeah, a really amazing example. And I think it's given fishermen in line, you know, that that evidence to show we can exist here, we should be here, and we're doing it, we're in harmony with the marine environment.
So what have we learned? We really need to invest time in relationships and trust. Trust building is really important. It takes a really long time. I really need to identify common areas of interest and concern. There's also no point in doing a fisheries initiative if the fishermen you're working with don't want to do it. They don't want to chill a unit, then don't do it. There's no point. Um, and it's really important to work with the fishermen to do the research. So Blue, um, in our work, we try to pay fishermen a day rate, so we do the research on their boats. That means that they understand what's going on and we trust the science when it comes out. That makes it a lot easier for us to have, for us to have difficult management um, discussions later down the line. And it's really important to support initiatives that will help them earn a better living um, from the area and invest in long-term monitoring so we can track all of that change. I think the best step for me that has come out of line in terms of monitoring is a project that we did with Plymouth Uni, Exeter Uni and others to look at well-being of fishermen. And out of the time that we've been working with them, um, we did a project came out in 2016 that showed that static fishermen within the reserve compared to static and mobile fishermen outside of the reserve had the highest job satisfaction, highest income and lowest levels of stress in conflict, which is just amazing. Great, happy fishermen, but also amazing to show that. And I think that's yeah, it's something that we really want to see um, in Sussex as well. There's also been really incredible results for marine life. We've got seven times more pink sea fans, eighty four percent more species overall. So really great that marine life is flourishing alongside fishermen's livelihoods. We're just beginning this in Sussex, and a lot of our work this year, from a blue perspective, has been starting to invest and be involved in some of the research that's going on to help establish that baseline that we've heard so many people talk about today. One of the projects um, that was mentioned in the film is a baited underwater video survey. So putting down um, little cameras across the area, you can see all the sample um, areas there marked with the red, um, and putting a little camera down and seeing what's there. And this, you saw a little video, but this is really helping us understand what mobile fish, what mobile species are out there. There's a little ray there, cheeky green at the back, I think you just see them, and then I think there's a conger eel that can slide into the sea. Um, and this, we hope, will not only just happen this year, we want to do it every single year, and that will really help us to understand the impact of the MPA. And this work is being um, for the bylaw area, so, and this work is being um, led by Sussex University. We also, and have done this year, started a shellfish spotting study. So in talking to fishermen, one of the main things that some of them have said is we're really concerned about our crab and lobster stocks, as are many fishermen around the UK. Many inshore fishermen are completely um, uh, completely uh, unable to access quota and have to go after fish that are non-quota, so crab, lobster, cuttlefish and whelk all fall within that bracket. And they often don't have that many management measures at a national level. Um, so we have a lot of fishermen going after the same fish sometimes. So we've been working with local Selsey fishermen to do a pot um, survey over the summer. We surveyed 12 sites. The reason for doing the survey is to assess um, the reasons for decline in crab and lobster and really help us to understand whether the bylaw is going to have an impact on these stocks. And we hope to expand to more fishermen in 2022. Again, here's the map. So you can see what we did was go out with the fishermen, drop pots like we normally would, and then we hold them again and counted every single crab, lobster, and other species that came up in the pot. So that included juveniles and adults. So that will really help us to understand as you can see, we've got samples inside and outside the bylaw. Are stocks increasing within the bylaw area? And that will really, I think, help us to understand. We've removed one factor, trawling, but are there other factors? You know, we keep hearing about sedimentation, pollution, climate change. What are some of the other factors maybe having an impact on these stocks that are so important to fishermen? As I said, we've been doing a lot of talking and trying to get to know the fishing communities around Sussex. We've got a lot more work to do on this and really understand what they want, their pressures and the aspirations that they want for the area. We undertook a socioeconomic survey as well this year of commercial fishermen, and that is really the first step in trying to do a long-term project, which will hopefully give us some of the results that I was able to share about Lyme around how fishermen's well-being, livelihoods, income have been impacted. We also did a sediment impact workshop um, this year, led by Sam, my colleague, and that was really as a response to hearing so many people say that they feel sediment is a really big problem um, in Sussex, and we're hoping that can inform future management. So I'm going to finish by sharing a little film. So one of the 
fishing communities that we've been engaging with is are the Bogner fishermen. And one of, I think actually more than one of them are here today, but I can see one right in front of me, Clive, here he is. His family has been fishing from Bogner Beach for generations. And sadly, I think 15 years ago or so, you gave up fishing completely because you couldn't make a living. Um, and he has now got his boat back along with a few other Bogner fishermen. And because of the bylaw, they have decided to go fishing again for the first time in 15 years. And I'm going to share this little film to tell you a little bit about that. And this happened just last week, last Wednesday. It's really amazing. I've always loved fishing, I've always had a boat. It's like having a pair of shoes, having a boat for me. My father-in-law, I had the greatest respect for him and I really did get on well. I can remember something he said to me. We were cod fishing just along the beach. He said, how'd you get on? I went, yeah, we've had a brilliant day today. Really hit, hit, hit the fish today. And he opened the basket, we used to cover them over, and he went, what's that? He said, what are you doing? Well, how many cod are you going to catch in August? Well, we don't. No, exactly. You, you leave your lobsters till August, catch your cod now and a few crab, because them lobsters now are gone. You're not going to catch them again in August. You can't keep fishing everything for today. There's got to be something for tomorrow. The reason I stopped fishing in 1999 was that I, I couldn't make a living out of it and the weather was really bad and we'd had eight or nine weeks, bills were mounting up. I couldn't earn a living out of it anymore. How true he was. Those words really mean a lot to me that, you know, we need to be looking after what we've got because there ain't a lot left. We want to put something back now. We want to still show that we can catch fish and there's fish to be had. We've got to give the edge. We've got to give the percentage back to the fish, not us have the percentage on the fish. Today is what we normally do, it's my fishing day. We went off and we get given what we get given. In other words, whatever swims into the net. We've managed to stop the pear trawlers. The fish life coming back in shore now is, is just, it, it, it's just incredible. It really is, and it, it ain't taken long. We have never seen so many pods of dolphins as this year part of what should be out there. Everyone should be entitled to see that. The kelp beds are very important. We used to have big kelp beds inside here. That's all gone. It's literally gone. It used to be just a forest. Why is it gone? My theory is that the water temperature has warmed up and I think kelp doesn't like the hot, warmer water. Secondly, we're getting more summer storms. So the kelp gets knocked off when it's still growing. By doing what I'm doing, which is using trammel nets, gill nets, I can go out there and earn a living selling it to these people that, that love it. They absolutely love it and they will keep coming. And they're going, what are we having tomorrow, Clive? What's on tomorrow, Clive? They'd eat fish four or five days a week because it's lovely. They'd sooner eat that than eat meat. It's not processed, it's reasonable price and it's, they're catching sustainably, so it's, it's all good. Thanks, Kai. Thank you very much. It's local traders, so I'm all for it. This is what we've always done. We've always sold fish like this. All along the south coast, there are fishing communities who are doing the same type of work, and we really should be, as residents, we really should be supporting every effort to improve the state of our coastal waters. I want to be able to carry on doing what I've always enjoyed doing. And I, and I would love to see two young, three young, four young lads come along and go, cool, we'd love to be part of that. 
we want to do this, this is something we want to do, you know. That's how we started, that's how Terry started, how Dick started, uh, within a mile of this bit of beach where we all started. We loved it. And we grew up on this beach. It's... Look at that. How can you not want to grow up with that? It's, it's just, wow, it's, you don't get better than this. <laughs>